You're listening to the sermon podcast of North Valley Baptist Church. This week's message is preached by Pastor Scott McGrady. Hope you would take your Bibles and turn to Proverbs 26. Proverbs 26, we're going to be looking at verses 18 to 28. Proverbs 26, verses 18 to 28. Now, I think you know that psychology and and counseling that incorporates psychology uh, is not something I support. (laughs) Um, And uh, I believe that psychology is man-centered and steeped in humanism. And so the ideology that comes from that, that kind of therapy, uh, I do not believe is, is helpful, but that scripture is sufficient. Now, I say all that, why? Because I'm going to quote from psychology today here to start off. Um, and I think even in this quote, you may see some of, some of the issues that are there. So in an article from psychology today, this was said, deception refers to the act, big or small, cruel or kind, of encouraging people to believe information that is not true. Lying is a common form of deception, stating something known to be untrue with the intent to deceive. Now, as I already said, cruel or kind, I don't know how that's kind, but okay. It goes on. While most people are generally honest, okay, Note that. It says most people are generally honest. It goes on to say, even those who subscribe to honesty engage in deception sometimes. What defines sometimes? (laughs) It goes on to say, studies show that the average person lies several times a day. Sometimes. (laughs) Deception, really, that, that is in our natural selves, right? Apart from Christ, apart from the work of God, in of ourselves, are we not liars? I mean, is there anyone who has not broken that commandment? No, we all have. And again, what does that show? What does the outliving our life show? It shows the condition of our hearts, right? That's what we, we've been talking about. And as we come to our text here for this morning in in Proverbs 26, we see deception. We see an evil heart of the fool, and we see the dangers of one who is a fool, one with such a heart, especially as they try to deceive in covering up what is really in their hearts. And that is a dangerous thing. And so what we see in this text is, is the danger that is in foolishness. And even as we look through these verses, what what brings all of these verses together is the danger found in the fool described in this section. And so on this, John MacArthur said that these verses here, chapter 26, verses 18 through 28, he says, our picturesque discourse on the evil speaking of fools and its harmful effects. And we, we've been going through Proverbs the last few weeks. And, and in doing so, we, we've looked at where wisdom comes from. And that wisdom comes from God. We define wisdom too, right? So we need to define wisdom, biblical wisdom. And biblical wisdom is moral living to please God. Biblically, that's what it is to be wise. And so this wisdom comes from God. And in coming from God, we must then trust that God's ways are best. Even when voices in the world are shouting so loud that we should go another way and we should live a different kind of life, and even if that resonates with us somehow, that, that seems good to our understanding. No, we must trust in the Lord with all our heart and lean not on our own understanding, right? That's what we discussed. Even if our own reasoning, our own upbringing, our own feelings and opinions say, no, no, there's something better than what God's Word says. No, we must trust God. 
and in trusting God, obey God. And then two, we also discussed a bit of, of where foolishness comes from or where, where folly comes from. That when we live in sin, whatever the, the outpour of our lives are, if it's sinful, that's because of, there is sinfulness in our hearts. And so what is needed is a change of heart. And that only comes when we, we trust in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, right? When we, we hear the gospel and we repent and believe. Uh, that's where true change comes in. That's where we get a new heart. And those of us who are trusting in Christ alone for salvation, then we need to guard our hearts, that we don't let any corruption in. We must be careful. For again, the heart, from the heart, flows the springs of life. So again, we don't want to be our natural selves. We want to live lives that are pleasing to God, pleasing to our, our Lord and Savior, to love Him who so loved us. And so we don't want to be the fool, and we don't want to be the dangerous fool. A heart full of, of evil and hatred and wickedness and all kinds of things not to mention a heart that is deceitful, tries to cover up who we really are. And that's what we see in our text. We see a description of the dangerous fool. So let's, let's read our text here for this morning. Proverbs 26, verses 18 through 28. Like a madman who throws firebrands, arrows, and death is the man who deceives his neighbor and says, I'm only kidding. For lack of wood, the fire goes out, and where there is no whisper, quarreling ceases. As charcoal to hot embers and wood to fire, so is a quarrelsome man for kindling strife. The words of a whisperer are like delicious morsels. They go down into the inner parts of the body, like the glaze covering on earth, earthen vessels, our fervent lips with an evil heart. Whoever hates disguises himself with his lips and harbors deceit in his heart. When he speaks graciously, believe him not, for there are seven abominations in his heart. Though his hatred be covered with deception, his wickedness will be exposed in the assembly. Whoever digs a pit will fall into it, and a stone will come back on him who starts it rolling. A lying tongue hates its victims and a flattering mouth works ruin. So again, we, we see the destructiveness of the foolish person, and so the danger of a fool. The one with malice in their hearts, that is a dangerous person. And there's great danger in the one with malice and who tries to cover up that malice and make sure you can't see it. I think many of us, if not all of us, have experienced a person that is described here in verses 18 and 19. And maybe, maybe we just have not only experienced that person, maybe ourselves, we've, we've been that person. That person who, out of bitterness or jealousy, in anger, makes a cutting comment, said something that's, that's hurtful, with the intent to hurt. And once their words sink in like a dagger into the heart, they laugh it off and say, oh, I'm, I'm only joking. I, I, I'm just kidding. And because of what venom was on their lips and just how cruel what they said, you, you can't help but wonder, you're just joking? Are, are you, though? Now, others have pointed out, and I think it's worth pointing out, that what's not being said here is in what's in reference to practical jokes and, and you know, ha ha genuinely intending to have fun with one another. Uh, that's not what's in view here. But something said or even something done that is meant to be hurtful, that has malicious intent, and then is tried to be passed off by uh, the person just joking around, 
And so to be clear, if you've heard Charlie tell me that if he didn't care for me, he wouldn't make fun of me, I'm sure you can take that to heart. Or some of you who have advanced follicle receptors for the hormone DHT and so make fun of those of us who have more deficient facial hair growth. And I don't take offense. I'm not bitter. <laughs> no, in all seriousness, we should be able to joke around with one another. Uh, we should be able to have fun with each other. We should be able to laugh at ourselves. But in doing that, too, we should know each other, right? Uh, we should be cautious, loving each other, and, and knowing where one may be sensitive, and, and being understanding to that, knowing how one takes jokes. We should know each other in our interactions. And so, too, even if our intent is to truly be having fun and joking around, uh, there still really is no excuse for, for jokes or pranks that are harmful and, and hurt, uh, that do damage. Um, so we, we need to understand that there, there is, we still need to be accountable to one another and, and, and love each other. We also need to be gracious with one another. Uh, I know I've been one who was truly intending to be kidding around and, and having fun and, and did or said something that was damaging, and so the grace that I, I desired from that person, I should also be willing to give as well. And so we do need to have grace with each other, too. Uh, we, we, we all fail here at some point, uh, and we need to be gracious. But we also need to repent when necessary. And so I say all that, though, because, again, I want to emphasize what this passage is not saying, what it's not talking about, and give some qualification as well. Uh, this passage is not talking about when we are genuinely just having fun with one another and, and kidding around. This is when hurtfulness and damage is what is intended, and, but the person just tries to excuse us as, as if they're only kidding. It's a dangerous person, uh, like a madman who throws firebrands or without aim or purpose fires off deadly arrows, just like that kind of person is dangerous, so to one who intends harm but covers it up, like we read in verse 19, who deceives his neighbor by pretending his intent was just to be funny. They try to hide the intentions of their heart, maybe to escape the consequences of what they have said or done. And so they, they feign innocent motives. Someone like that cannot be trusted. So ha have any of us been like that? Have we intended harm but tried to pass it off as just kidding around, just joking? Have we pretended to have innocent motives when we were really trying to dig in a dagger with our words? Have we been like that? Now, what about what we read in the next two verses? Uh, verse 20 says, For lack of wood, the fire goes out, and where there is no whisperer, quarreling ceases. I think we understand the comparison here. Uh, if fire has no more fuel to devour, if there is no wood to burn up, eventually that fire is going to die out. So two whispers or, or gossip or slander in the same way is fuel to conflict. Stop the whispering, stop uh, the gossip, stop adding fuel to the fire, and eventually the fire of conflict will die out. And so we, we need to be careful here. Gossip, too, we, we have to understand what gossip is. Because sometimes we, we have a, a very narrow definition of gossip. Gossip is spreading something that is false about somebody. That, that certainly is gossip. If someone has told us something about someone else, and we have not done our due diligence to find out if it's true or not, and then we go tell somebody else, we, we spread it all the more, we're, we're, we're involved in that gossip. And that's wrong. But even if what we know about somebody is true, and it's not our place to go spread it and tell others, 
That's gossip too, even if it's true. And even how we may tell others that we kind of hide our gossip in prayer requests. Uh, it could still be gossip. We, we got to be careful. And gossip is a dangerous thing. Slander is a dangerous thing. We, we need not talk about people behind their backs. If we have a problem with someone, if we think there's something wrong, what do we need to do? Go to that person. Talk to that person. If we are in conflict with someone, we need to work it out with them. Not go behind their back and, and tell others about them. And, and what are we doing then if, if, if that's our actions? We're either trying to build ourselves up and make ourselves feel better, or we're trying to gain people on our side to join us against that person. And, and all of that is just fueling conflict. It's just stoking the fire. It's not helping anything. We need to be careful. We need to be adults about how we address conflict. We need to truly be people who love one another. And so if there is a problem, we, we should want to work it out and get it straightened out in, in a right way, in a loving way. We can't, we can do great damage when it comes to conflict, if we just spread slander and gossip. And when we stoke the fires of conflict, we're at risk of burning down the church. And obviously, I don't mean literally burning down the church, because that would refer to the building, and the church isn't the building. The church is the gathering of the people. It's you and I together. And we're going to destroy ourselves if we stoke the flames of conflict. We need to deal with it appropriately. But sometimes, because of our experience, because of what we've gone through, because of, of the hurt we've, we've had, we can be someone who goes around with a chip on their shoulder. And so wherever we go, we're, we're actually causing problems and causing conflict. And verse 21 says, As charcoal to hot embers and wood to fire, so is a quarrelsome man for kindling strife. Now remember what we talked about last week in the necessity of guarding our hearts. We have to guard our hearts from bitterness and from being contentious. Again, especially if we've been hurt. Especially if, if we've had experiences that have upset us or things didn't go uh, our way or, or at least our expectations were met. And whatever our problem is, we can't then carry that baggage on into other relationships. Or sometimes people are, are hurt in one church and they carry that baggage to another church and they just are stirring up problems. That's, that's not an okay thing. We need to be careful how we view others and how we treat others and that we're not just bringing our problems with us into those relationships and so causing problems and, and living with a chip on our shoulder. That's a dangerous person. A quarrelsome person will, will keep the fires of bitterness, discontent, and division burning uh, until there is no more conflict because there's no more relationships. There's no more church. It's a danger. So let's guard our hearts. When we enter into conflict, we need to do it with maturity and godliness. We're not to carry it with us into our other circumstances and relationships but we're to lovingly seek reconciliation. We're to work out with our problems with those we have the problem with. And we need to deal with it. Not let it simmer, not let it fester, not just sweep it under the rug because we don't want to deal with it. It's easier not to deal with it, right? But as you keep sweeping problems under the rug, suddenly the rug doesn't lay so flat. You got a big mound. And then that's another problem in itself. You try to squash things down and, and ignore them, eventually they're going to blow up. We need to deal with it and deal with it right away, maturely and lovingly. And as I thought about that idea of that we need to deal with conflict, 
appropriately and, and quickly, not just letting it fester and, and take root in our hearts, I, I thought of what Paul says in Ephesians 4, when he talks about not letting the sun go down on your anger. And, and initially, I was just going to go to that verse, but when I turned to that passage, I thought, no, let's look at this whole passage. I think this whole passage helps us in understanding how to avoid being the person described here in, in Proverbs 26. And so I'm thinking about Ephesians 4, verses 25 to 32. And there the context is that Paul is telling the Ephesians not to live any more like unbelievers, not to live any more like the Gentiles do, but to live having laid aside their old self and having put on the new self. That when we trusted in Christ, we took off who we used to be, and now we put on this, this new person who is renewed in Christ. And then we pick up the text there in chapter 4, verse 25, where Paul says, Therefore, if you've taken off the old self and put on the new self, therefore, having put away all the things that belong to your old self, having put away falsehood, and falsehood, I would argue, includes lying, exaggerating, bending the truth, um, telling half-truths, telling fabrications. All of that comes under falsehood. Having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor. For we are members of one another. We belong to each other in the body of Christ. We're members of one another. It says, be angry. Uh, sometimes anger is justified. Uh, when we are angry at the things that come against the glory of God and the reputation of our Lord, when we are angry at injustice towards those made in the image of God, anger can be justified. So be angry, but even if it's justified, do not sin. Still, even if your anger is right, how you carry out that anger, what you do with that anger, can still be sinful. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. Whatever conflict you have, whatever is bothering you and, and, and burning up inside, you must deal with it right away. Don't just sweep it under the rug. Don't ignore it. It must be dealt with. It's only going to cause more problems if we try to squish it down and, and pretend it's not there. Do your part to resolve it. Otherwise, it's going to grow inside and fester and cause bitterness and hatefulness to take root in your heart. Even anger that is righteous can soil your heart. And so don't let the sun go down on your anger and don't give any opportunity to the devil. Again, deal with it right away or else you can play into the hands of the enemy and be a means of destruction within God's church. He goes on, let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands, so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. And in verses 29 to 30, it says, let no corrupt, corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up, as fitting for the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. We're not to be tearing each other down. Our interactions, our, our talking with one another should be building each other up, should be edifying to one another. Again, we belong to each other. And so that means that slander and gossip should have no place among us. That doesn't build each other up. And we need to build each other up according to the circumstance, right? If we're encouraging each other, if we're exhorting each other, holding each other accountable, all of those things can be part of building each other up. But all of that is out of love for one another. It goes on, and, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. We grieve our God when we continue in ways that are like our old self, that are like the unbelievers, as opposed to living like one who is new in Christ. We grieve our God when we live that way. 
Uh, it's like the quote that I've, I've referenced, I don't know, a thousand times over from Steve Nichols. That you're no longer who you used to be. If you're trusting in Christ, if you have been saved, you're no longer who you used to be. So stop living like it. He goes on in verses 31 and 32. He says, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. My friends, in, instead of a heart soiled by bitterness and wrath, anger, clamor, and slander, we must be a people that's marked by forgiveness and reconciliation. Because we have been forgiven, and we've been forgiven so much by God, the one whom we have offended. We've been forgiven so much in Christ. And yet we can't forgive the infractions we have between one another. If that's the case, that's a big problem. We should be a people marked with forgiveness because we have been forgiven. Christ, Christ took upon the penalty for our sin, our sin against him. He took the penalty for that on himself on the cross. He paid for our sin in our place so that we could be reconciled to God. This is what God did for us. And if we have repented of our sin and put our faith in Christ alone for our salvation, we know God did this for us. We know we are saved in Christ. And so in response to that salvation, how can we, who have been sown such grace, be a people who are angry, be a people who slander and gossip, rather than be a people who forgive? Rather than be a people who seek reconciliation to do our part even with those who are the ones who offended us, who hurt us. When we live this way, we live like the unbelievers. We don't live like the people of God when we're full of anger and bitterness and slander and gossip. And we are a danger. And, and listen, if we go back to Proverbs here, in our text in chapter 26, uh, we are a danger to those that we are, are spreading that gospel gossip to. Not only are we a danger to the person we're gossiping about, we're a danger to those we gossip to. Verse 22 shows us that there's some kind of draw to gossip, kind of sick, twisted desire that we have for gossip. Right? It talks about gossip as being like a delicious morsel. Uh, literally, in the Hebrew, it says, like something greedily swallowed. Uh, when we hear gossip or we're spreading gossip, it's like something we can't get enough of. I just want more. It's kind of like Turkish delight to Edmund there in Narnia. Just, you know, it just wants more. And it goes down into us and corrupts us from the inside out. We need to guard against that. We need to be not a people who gossip, and we need to be people who do not receive gossip either. We need to guard against it. When, when someone comes to us with gossip... We need to, for both the protection of ourselves and that person, we need to stop it right in its tracks. For their sake and also for the sake of the whole church, we need to lovingly and earnestly confront and call out the gossiper to repent. And again, I know I've been guilty of letting the person talk. But we shouldn't. We must say, listen, I'm not comfortable with this. I don't think this is right. We should not be having this conversation. Why are you telling me about this? Go to that person. Talk to them. That's the right thing to do. And that's what we must do. We've got to stop it. If we're part of allowing the gossip to continue, we're part of fanning the flames. We're part of adding fuel to the fire. And we don't want to do that. It's destructive and it's a danger. And so we see in these verses the, the, the dangerous fool. He's a, a gossip. He's a quarrelsome person. He's one who tries to hide his true intentions by pretending he's just 
just trying to have fun. But not just that. We also see he's one who tries to hide the evil in his heart with flattery. So we come to verse 23. It says, Like the glaze covering an earthen vessel, our fervent lips with an evil heart. Uh, so you take this, this pottery. Someone has, has pottery. And really, this pottery, is, it's cheap. It's poorly made. It's rough. When you feel it, it maybe has, has uh, chips in it, or there's a word I'm looking for, ditches. Anyway, it's not smooth. <laughs> Uh, it, it's fragile, it, it's going to break easy, it's not, it's not, it doesn't have quality craftsmanship to it. But someone can take that and put glaze over it, and so it looks smooth, it looks shiny, it looks nice, it looks like it's well made. But on closer examination, you can tell, now, this, this, this is junk. It's not nice. The glaze covers over what it really is. And so in the same way, Flattery can be like the glaze on a pot that's really cheap, making it look expensive, where flattery makes someone look like a friend when really they have an evil heart. That person is a fake. His words should not be trusted. And so just like the one in verses 18 to 19 who covers up their intentions uh, by feigning uh, innocent, in innocent motives— so to this one covers up their heart by feigning love and admiration. Uh, there were two commentators I read, actually, that, that compared this or, or gave an illustration of this with Judas. Judas's kiss to Jesus. Feigning love and admiration. And again, remember what we've said about the heart. How we live our actions, all this comes from the condition of our hearts. And, and as we've gone through this text, uh, we see the one who harbors deceit in their heart. In verse 23, uh, the, the evil heart. And it's from such a heart that flows the springs of their lives. What are the words you speak? What are your actions, your sinful actions? What deceit is there in you? These can be indicators, or are indicators, of the condition of your heart. My friends, we can't hide our hearts. That's a danger when we try to hide our hearts. We must be open and honest. Let us confess our sin and expose the sin in true repentance and show a heart that desires to honor God with all of our living. And everything that we say and do, uh, let us not keep it to ourselves where it will kill us and cause us to be a fool, a dangerous fool to everyone else. The one who feigns love and kindness is dangerous. And when such a person speaks graciously, he should not be believed. Even if his words are charming, there's malice in his heart. And we see verse 25 says, for there are seven abominations in his heart. Uh, this could be referring to Proverbs 6, verses 16 to 19, where we see a list of the things that God hates. Such things that God hates fills his heart. In verse 26 here, it makes it clear that such a one may be able to hide their malice in their heart for some time. They may be able to cover over, glaze over an evil heart with their flattery for a moment, but eventually the truth of their heart will be revealed. Eventually, it'll be made known. And really, that's true about all, all of our sin, any sin. We can hide things in our hearts. We can hide our private lives. We can do it for so long, but one day, it's all going to come out. Now, even if it doesn't come out in this life, it's going to come out in the day of judgment. The Scriptures make that clear. Whatever is done in the dark will be brought to the light. And my friends, Please heed this warning. It is better that it comes into the light now than on that day. Please recognize that. It'll come out. We can't, we can't continue to hide the evil in our hearts. 
And when we do, we are a danger. A danger to those around us. A danger to those we interact with. But even, too, as we come to verse 27, we're also a danger to ourselves, if that's who we are. Look at verse 27. Whoever digs a pit will fall into it, and a stone will come back on him who starts it rolling. The one who intends harm for someone else, the one with evil in his heart and malice, in the end, he'll only harm himself. Not only, but also himself. Uh, This is kind of like Haman in the book of Esther, who builds the gallows for for Mordecai to hang from. Uh, But in the end, Haman himself is the one who hangs from those gallows. Whether it's hatred, malice, jealousy, bitterness, or deceit, or any other sin, it's a grave danger to everyone and ourselves if that's what's in our hearts. Again, as we discuss church discipline, when so many don't understand how that's a loving thing to do, it is for the sake of that one in sin who refuses to repent and the sake of everyone else because they are a danger to everyone and themselves. Sin is deadly. And out of love, we want to show them the urgency of their repentance and protect the church at large. That's why Scripture commands us to do it. It's a loving thing for that person and for the church at large. We all need accountability. There's none of us who aren't susceptible to letting in bitterness and hate and and division into our hearts. And when it's there, there's not any of us who are not susceptible to trying to hide it and cover it. We all are susceptible to that. We all need the accountability of our brothers and sisters. I believe that's why God put us together in community. To be together, to, to lift each other up, to build each other up. To point each other to the sufficiency of God and his word. We all need that. Sin is deadly. In verse 28, it says, A lying tongue hates its victims, and a flattering mouth works ruins. Do you have a lying tongue? A lying tongue is hateful. It's hateful. I mean, even go back to verse 26. And if we have a flattering mouth, why do we flatter? Why do we, we build someone up and make them think that we, we just admire you so much? Oh, you're great. And really, we have evil intent to manipulate them, to get what we want from them. The flattering mouth brings them to ruin. Can we see the danger here? There's danger in deception. There's danger in an evil heart. There's danger in a, a, a quarrelsome person. And one who spreads gossip. There's danger. The fool is a danger. Do we see that? And when we are such a danger, we are not living as one who truly knows God. When we are such a danger, we're living like the unbelievers. We're not living like the ones who have been saved by Jesus Christ. We're not living like ones who have put off the old self and put on the new. So what is the condition of our hearts? Have we been changed? Are we being changed from the inside out? Are we pursuing to see the sin in us be put to death? Or are we letting it take root and contaminate our hearts and see that contamination in the outliving of our lives? We need to guard our hearts, for from it flows the springs of life. So again, back to Ephesians 4. If we're trusting in Christ, if we have a right standing before God because of Jesus and his right standing before God, because his substitutionary death on our behalf, if we're trusting in him to have paid the penalty for our sin and set us free, that by his resurrection power we have been risen to a new life, then when we trusted in Christ, we put off the old self. And so let's just take a step back from what we read in Ephesians 4. And and look at what Paul says there in, in verses 21 to 24. 
It says, assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus, put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your mind and to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. And then there, that's when Paul says, therefore, put off, put away the things of your old self, put off falsehood, put off lying and and deceitfulness and exaggeration, and speak the truth to one another. If you're anger, angry, even if it's righteous anger, deal with it. Be loving towards one another. And instead of corrupt talk, we should be building each other up. If we are truly saved, if we are in Christ, we are no longer who we used to be. And our aim is not just for our own selfish gain, but our aim is for the building up of one another to love each other, to be gracious with each other, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. So my friends, let us no longer be deceitful. Let us no longer be hiding wickedness in our hearts, but let our hearts be exposed that we may grow in holiness, conforming more and more into the likeness of our great God who saved us. Let that be what we look like. Let that be what we're known for, our Christ-likeness, our, our love, our forgiveness, our, our, our grace, and our, our service to one another, being for one another, not just being for ourselves. Not trying to hide who we really are for our own selfish gain. Let that be how we're characterized. Not like the unbelieving world, but having put off the old self and now living in the new. Thank you for listening to the sermon podcast of North Valley Baptist Church. For the complete sermon archive and more information about the church, please go to visitnvbc.com.